On page 119, we'll look at polyesters. And polyesters are indeed a very important brand of polymers used in manufacturers fibers and coatings as well as plastics themselves. There's a variety of ways to manufacture esters including direct esterification, a carboxylic acid and an alcohol, or transesterification, starting with an ester and exchanging its OR group for a different OR group. Then of course we have an acid chloride plus alcohol or acid anhydride plus alcohol. I trust the direct esterification mechanism is familiar to you. Here we want to react the weakly electrophilic carbonyl carbon of a carboxylic acid with a weak nucleophile like an alcohol and it's just not going to happen unless we add a strong acid catalyst as in this case sulfuric acid. So once protonated by sulfuric acid it forms a reasonably good electrophile to which even a weak nucleophile like an alcohol oxygen can add. When that alcohol group adds, the next step is proton transfer to the hydroxyl group, which will become the leaving group in the final step. Um, to finish off, the catalyst is regenerated. I'm showing bisulfate here as removing the catalyst added, the proton. The pi bond reforms. The water group leaves, generating the ester, condensing out water, and catalyst regenerated. Now, in fact, it wouldn't be bisulfate to gain the hydrogen ion. Sulfuric acid is too strong an acid for that to occur, but it would likely be the water group removing the hydrogen ion forming hydronium, but in either case, the catalyst is regenerated. Now, transesterification, also called ester exchange, goes by exactly the same process as that, except we start with... Uh, an ester rather than a carboxylic acid. So once again, it would have to protonate our weakly acidic carbonyl in the ester, and then that will create a carbocation to which even a weak nucleophile like an alcohol could add. Then if ultimately there'll be a proton transfer to the old OR group that becomes the leaving group. The same process as above, giving us an ester with a new OR group and an alcohol byproduct. Base catalyzed transesterification is very straightforward. Um, to confess here, I don't think I drew that correctly, sodium hydride is in fact ionic, not covalent, but, but in a uh, non-aqueous solution, perhaps, it's, um, it acts covalently. In any case, very strong base deprotonates the weakly acidic hydrogen of an alcohol to form an alkoxide. An alkoxide, um, if the pKa of an alcohol is 16 and the pKb of an alkoxide is 14 minus the pKa, so its pKb will be negative 2-ish. And that's strong enough to react with the weak electrophilic carbon of a carbonyl and ester, as shown here. The pi bond will break. It will reform if there's a leaving group. And it does reform. The leaving group is another alkoxy group of equivalent basicity, not a good leaving group. PKB of minus 2 is a strong base, poor leaving group, but um, equilibrium should drive it to the right given some heat, and in fact it does. A more elegant, although probably less practical, way to do that is using the most reactive of the electrophilic carbonyls, that would be the acid chlorides. So even a weak nucleophile on collision with a very good electrophile like an acid chloride will bond, the pi bond breaks, and will reform if there's a leaving group. In this case, chloride is a good leaving group because it's completely non-basic. Giving us then a protonated ester. Uh, I show chloride here as deprotonating it and giving us the ultimate ester product. Since we have HCl as a byproduct, a tertiary amine would be added to uh, assist moving the reaction forward by removing the byproduct HCl. 
Anhydride would work in the same fashion, almost as reactive as an acid chloride when a weak nucleophile like an alcohol collides. They'll bond with the carbonyl because the pi bond can break. The pi bond can reform if there's a leaving group. In this case, leaving group would form a carboxylate. Now, a carboxylate is much less basic than an alkoxide. PKB of a carboxylate is approximately Oh, my, uh, PKB is about 5, and so that's a better leaving group. It'll give us our final neutral ester product and a carboxylic acid byproduct. So there's some simple mechanisms for esterification in the polymer world. We'll look at some linear and some cross-linked thermoset polyesters. Let's start with the most important of all the polyesters, polyethylene terephthalate. That's your pop bottle. And there's a structure of terephthalic acid, 1,4-benzene dicarboxylic acid. It's, it's the starting dicarboxylic acid. However, terephthalic acid is very high melting. And it sublimes at 300 degrees C and it's insoluble in most solvents and so it's really not convenient at all to use if, if, if impossible even so instead its dimethyl ester is used so we start with um, dimethyl terephthalate so this would be a transesterification this stuff melts at 141 degrees C much more amenable soluble in methanol and ethylene glycol so polymerization is carried out either in bulk or in solution, for example, with excess ethylene glycol as solvent. This is transesterification, in which the OR group replaces the OCH3 group, and this is done with acid catalyst. We looked at the mechanism 200 degrees for a few hours, driving out methanol and we'll get a low molecular weight polyethylene terephthalate ester and what will that look like something like this then our repeating group we have to have the ethylene groups and then it just carries on from there again so That's polyethylene, see the ethylene group here on the right, and then terephthalate. That's then heated at a higher temperature under vacuum to drive off the eth excess ethylene glycol. Now, ethylene glycol's normal boiling point is about 200 degrees Celsius. Ethylene glycol is radiator antifreeze, so you can appreciate to boil that off is not going to be easy, hence the vacuum distillation. And under those conditions, we get a high molecular weight polyethylene terephthalate. We know it as Dacron fiber mylar film, very high melting. And let's take a look at some of the images here. Again, polyethylene terephthalate uh, pop bottles. Um, perhaps you're familiar with some fabrics. You ever go to fabric land? Uh, Fortrell is a trade name for polyethylene um, terephthalate fiber, as is Dacron and Terylene. Now, these are all chemically the same, uh, polyethylene terephthalate. Terylene as socks. This is uh, mylar. Mylar is the film form of polyethylene terephthalate used in sailboats. And here's an example of a piece of fabric from a, from a sail. This is called the scrim mylar, and it has polyester fiber, the yellow fibers and the black fibers laid right into the polyester film, the mylar. Both are chemically the same. They're both polyethylene terephthalate. It's a wonderful material. Here's another polyester, a very, very simple one. This is polyparahydroxybenzoic acid. Notice here, parahydroxybenzoic acid. 
This will be your standard Fischer esterification reaction, uh, protonation of the carbonyl oxygen, pi bond breaking to form that bond. Another hydroxyl group from another monomer can react here at the carbonyl. So when that undergoes polymerization, we will have just simply this structure. That's about it, just a repeating unit. And that's polypara-hydroxybenzoic acid, or polyparabenzoate in a UPAC. I chose to show this one because it's just so simple, and it's a unique material. It um, has unusual uh, optical properties. It polarizes light when an electrical potential, that is a voltage, is applied. And they used to make up the liquid crystal displays of watches and calculators. So here we see like, some examples of that. So something that's quite familiar to us. The parasubstitution on the aromatic ring creates high linearity, allows close alignment, tight packing of chains, and this packing coupled with short distances between the polar ester groups gives rise to some relatively high melting points of 260 to 270 degrees Celsius. Let's look next at polycarbonates famous, famous polymers. These are polyesters of carbonic acid, famous for their impact resistance and optical clarity. Now, carbonic acid itself is unstable, right? It decomposes into carbon dioxide and water, and it's said that at any given time in solution, 95% of carbonic acid is really decomposed as CO2. So it's actually the derivatives of carbonic acid, such as phosgene. This is phosgene here, carbonyl dichloride, or diphenyl carbonate, which I show down here. Here's diphenyl carbonate. These are used instead. Now the alcohol portion for this esterification reaction, if you will, is um, a diol called 2,2, let me point to it as we read it here, 2,2-bis. Um, two two now, whenever you hear the word bis, that means two identical units. So here, let me number this. This is carbon 1, 2, 3. So we're saying on the second carbon, there's substituents, there's two of them. So we're going to name it 2, the one on the left, and again on the right, 2, 2. Now why it's not sufficient to just say 2, 2 and have to put the bis in, I'm not sure, but in some of the larger organic molecules, when that difunctional group is large, they prefix it with a bis. In any case, that means there's two of these, 2, 2, bis, 4 hydroxy phenyls. See them here? 4, 1, 2, 3, 4 hydroxy phenyl groups on the propane main chain. So that's 2, 2, bis, 4 hydroxy phenyl propane. And the common name for that is bisphenol A. Maybe you've heard of that. You probably have once I tell you about it. And I will in just a minute. Now phosgene gas, here it is here, carbonyl dichloride, is so reactive that it can simply be bubbled directly into a solution of bisphenol A in pyridine at room temperature or a suspension of bisphenol A and methylene chloride stirred in aqueous sodium hydroxide. So why the pyridine? Why the sodium hydroxide? Well, that's their basis, and they would consume the byproduct HCl that you're going to see form in the reaction here. So the reaction is typical of a acid chloride. Here's our weak nucleophile alcohol group reacting readily with this extremely reactive electrophile. It's a carbonyl attached to two electronegative chlorines. The pi bond will of course break to accommodate the pair of electrons donated from the oxygen and the pi bond will reform if we have a leaving group. And in fact we do the chlorines are a good leaving group because chloride is non-basic. So it liberates, it releases chloride, um, which ultimately 
then deprotonates the hydroxyl group, liberating HCl. Let's draw our polymer here. Let's look at both sides of this at the same time. There's one of our bisphenol groups. Here's the other one. And then we have our uh, carbonate group, if you will. Oh, I drew the carbon in there, but it'll stay. Okay. Here. There. That's polycarbonate. Trade name is Lexan. Melting point 230. Now, phosgene is, is quite toxic. It actually was used in chemical warfare. I have some pictures of uh, phosgene burns. So, as um, appealing that might be chemically to make it in that fashion, it might not be a great place to work. Another way to make this that is done is with diphenyl carbonate, far less, uh, far less dangerous. Still going to work the same way. We'll have a weak nucleophile bonding to the carbonyl carbon. Uh, the pi bond will break to accommodate it. The pi bond will reform there's a, if there's a leaving group. In fact, there is. It's the phenoxy group. And that'll put our oxygen connect bonded to our carbon. And then deprotonation uh, later removes the hydroxyl group. And we'll produce again uh, polycarbonate. This time the byproduct would not be HCl but phenol. So note that even though both are produced by the reaction of diols with diacids, polycarbonates are actually structurally different than polyesters. So here's carbonic acid, sodium carbonate. Notice it's O carbonyl O, and hence a polycarbonate is. O carbonyl O, whereas a polyester is really O carbonyl R, but they're so much alike they're grouped together here. We should look at some photographs. This is um, Lexan or Merlon, bulletproof glass, uh, wonderful material. Other applications that we'll talk about further, I'll just point them out here. Polycarbonate has a high index of refraction. And so it's used to make lenses for glasses that are essentially um, unbreakable because polycarbonate is so strong. They can be relatively thin lenses. I mean, which would you like to have? You know, the obvious choice. Now, there are, I understand, thinner materials available today, but certainly polycarbonate is the strongest of all the lens materials. All right, uh, another polyester we want to look at briefly is poly E caprolactone. So poly E caprolactone is made by ring opening of a cyclic lactone, a cyclic ester called a lactone. Um, here I've drawn the lactone and the open chain form. So if you number this with me in a U pack, this would be carbon one, two, three, four, five, six, that's six hydroxy hexanoic acid. And the the ester from this would be six hydroxy hexanoic acid lactone. But in the common system this would be alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, that'd be E hydroxy caproic acid. And as a cyclic lactone it's called alpha, beta, gamma, delta. E, epsilon E, caprolactone. In any case, that can be ring opened to a unsubstituted ester group. Simply just like that. So that's poly E caprolactone. Um, and I, I, I show it here because, again, it's just so simple and some neat applications for it. Um, it's used to make self-dissolving stitches. It's used for tissue regeneration, apparently. 
yeah, the um, dissolves slowly in acid conditions, so it's used for stitches in internal wounds. Good stuff. All right, uh, this is a high volume, very important application, a little more complex, but it's worth the time. All right, so saturated alkyd polyester resins for paints. And I refer you to um, this section on lipids. It's actually no longer on Blackboard. It's in the notes on page 163 in the appendix, and we should take a look at that for a couple of minutes. Right, so structures and names of common fatty acids. Nature has this predisposition for creating even numbered carboxylic acids, particularly above 10. So uh, carbon 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, and so on. Lauric, myristic, palmitic, steric. Those are so common in foods and oils that you just should be familiar with them. These are the saturated carboxylic acids, carbon 12, 14, 16, and 18, and 20. And then there are unsaturated versions, the 16 carbon unsaturated palmitoleic with one double bond. Oleic, uh, equivalent to steric acid, but one double bond. And then we have linoleic, probably the most famous ones, linoleic and linolenic, polyunsaturated fatty acids of 18 carbons. Those are so common and important in diet and nutrition. Interesting that most, if not all double bonds, not all, but most are cis rather than trans. Um, let's see, saturated fats have a uniform, long, zigzag shape that allows them to pack tightly. Unsaturated fats cannot pack tightly because the cis double bonds introduce kinks and bends in the hydrocarbon chains disrupting packing crystallization. Do you recall this from earlier organic chemistry? Here is uh, in our first course. Here is a packing of a saturated hydrocarbon. You call it polyethylene if you wish. Here it is with trans unsaturation. It packs quite tightly. When you have cis unsaturation, they don't pack well at all. The geometry characteristic in this fashion, cis unsaturation, is of commercial importance in the margarine industry. Most margarines are produced by hydrogenation of vegetable oils. The vegetable oils have this cis unsaturation, so they have uh, lower melting points, that is, they're liquid at lower temperatures. When we saturate them, we make them more like trans and they pack more tightly. All right, so take a look here. This is the structure of a triglyceride. A triglyceride is a triester of glycerol. I'm trusting you've covered this at some point before. This is 1, 2, 3 propane trial called glycerin or glycerol. Nature employs it a great deal and makes these triesters of it, where on the right part we have these fatty acids of these esters. These fatty acids run anywhere from 12 to 20 carbons long. In fact, even perhaps 8 and 10 to 12 to 20 carbons long. Some of them are saturated, some of them are unsaturated. So that's a triester, or triacylglyceride. And that's what we're going to start with in the manufacture of a polyester. These commercially available triesters of glycerin, available from plants in large abundance. Yeah, approximately 40 different fatty acids occur naturally. Palmitic and steric are most abundant. Oleic and linoleic are the most important unsaturated fatty acids. Oleic is monounsaturated, whereas linoleic and linolenic have two more double bonds and are referred to as polyunsaturated, or PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids. Linoleic and linolenic acids occur in cream and are essential to the human diet. Infants grow poorly and develop skin lesions if fed on a diet of non-fat milk. Just such important basic uh, information for chemists to know. And then of course, uh, a little bit more here. I took this from a consumer's report. They listed a number of fats compared to oils. What's the difference? Well, look at fats include things like lard and butter and human fat, and whale fat, and beef fat, whereas oils from plants, 
coconut, corn, olive, peanut, linseed, soybean, herring, what's the difference? They give a breakdown of the uh, fatty acids within them. Now, this, these are not 100%. Um, they don't add to 100. They just represent the major portions. But if you look at this broadly, you will see that the oils that come from plants have a higher proportion of unsaturated fatty acids. Look at corn oil is 80% unsaturated fats. Olive oil, 87. Peanut oil, 80%. Linseed oil, well, that's lower, 40. Soybean, what's that, 50, 80 again. Compared to, say, fats, which have a lower percentage of unsaturated fats and higher percentage of saturated fats. It's generally um, believed that our diet should include higher proportion of unsaturated fats for health purposes. And, of course, these triglycerides containing all these fatty acids are um, saponified. They are hydrolyzed in base solution to obtain the glycerol and the fatty acids from which we make soaps. Um, and then this leads us to uh, the subject of micelles, which we talked about before. So it, it all is one large connected piece uh, in which these same polymer molecules or these same organic molecules again and again in different applications. Let's go back to our look at polyesters. This is how um, we use these to make paints. So phthalic anhydride, right here, phthalic anhydride, is difunctional. And we're going to react it with glycerol, which is trifunctional, and they react to form a three-dimensional cross-linked thermoset called a glyptal. So let's just look at the mechanism. So this is an anhydride whose carbon is very electrophilic and the alcohol can in fact react with that. Here's our weak nucleophile colliding with our good electrophile. The pi bond breaks. The pi bond will reform if there's a leaving group and so it does. The leaving group is now a carboxylate. So the carboxylate will ultimately deprotonate this hydrogen, whether it goes directly or th through the solution, doesn't really matter. It gives us then uh, one ester group on top, leaving us with a carboxylic acid group on the bottom, which we've already seen can react in the presence of acid, acid-catalyzed Fischer esterification of a carboxylic acid and an alcohol gives us another ester linkage. So there's a anhydride, showing that it can be used to make a difunctional ester group. So here I've turned that phthalic anhydride on its side, and now I've lined it up with a trifunctional alcohol, in this case glycerol. And so you can, I think, easily see how we'll get a linear thermoplastic through these ester linkages here. And then the glycerol, being trifunctional, can react in between the chains, if you will, with another phthalic anhydride to produce a cross-linked thermoset, as we see here. And this is called a glyptal. Now, glyptals are brittle because they're high cross-link density. They're thus, they're thus unsuitable to be used alone as paints, but they're added to paints and coatings because they improve their gloss and adhesion. Okay, let's look next at how alkyd paints are actually made from oils. So this is unsaturated, oil-modified alkyd paints. Triglyceride, as we showed before, like tongue oil, and tongue is just the nut of a tree called a tongue tree, they are triesters of unsaturated fatty acids, such as linoleic and linolenic acids. They are in the R groups here, these 12 carbon, 14 carbon, 16, 18 carbon unsaturated fatty acid groups within the triester. So paint manufacturers abstract these oils from nuts and trees and they react them with glycerol in a 2 to 1 molar ratio of glycerol to triglycerides in an ester exchange or transesterification reaction. Let's take a look at that. So here we have our weak nucleophile 
which when acid catalyzed reacts with our weak electrophile, the pi bond will break, the pi bond will reform if we have a leaving group, and we do. We have this alkoxy group, which will ultimately deprotonate, remove um, this hydrogen here. And so let me just color in, if I've exchanged one of these for an ester group and these hydroxyl groups, that group becomes this group right over here. Can you follow that? So the top left group has become this top right group. Let's consider that again down here. Take this oxygen to this other carbonyl group. This is transesterification reaction. The pi bond breaks. The pi bond will reform. If the leaving group leaves, then it does. Okay, so when that happens, let me do a different color. Then this glycerin becomes this group over here. Right? And that leaves this piece in the center. See if I can find another color here. This piece in the center becomes this alcohol over here. The two H groups on the end and the ester in the middle. So two moles of glycerol, one mole of triester gives us three moles or three molecules three of glycerol monomers. These are now diols. Right? See, each of these is a diol and therefore difunctional. So this is what's done commercially to make paints. So here we have our diols that we just generated from um, our tongue oil or whatever, corn oil, whatever it happens to be, reacted with phthalic anhydride, which is difunctional. Right? An acid anhydride and an alcohol is going to make an ester. There's our linear ester. Now, that's the end of the reaction. It's a thermoplastic. And what I've simply done here is taken this R group and now expanded it to show you. Remember that R group is not just a simple, simple alkyl group. It's 12 to 20 carbon long um, fatty acid that's typically unsaturated, as in linoleic or linolenic. So when the thermoplastic alkyd paint is applied to the surface, the solvent evaporates and exposes the thermoplastic to air. The alkene groups in the unsaturated fatty acid esters are cross-linked by oxygen, yielding a thermoset coating. So oxygen will cross-link, say for example here to here, and here maybe to here, and maybe to another chain on the other side, sorry here, and so on. So the oxygen in the air will do the cross-linking. Uh, metals of cobalt or lead or zinc or lithium are added as accelerators in the oxidative cross-linking process. So that's how paints are made, uh, extracted from oils. Let's see, this fall in the picture here. Um, a representative triglyceride from a drying oil. It's a triester. This triester is derived from three different unsaturated fatty acids. Linoleic on the top, alpha linoleic in the middle, and oleic at the bottom. The order of drying rate is alpha linoleic to linoleic to oleic. Now I don't I didn't know anything really anything about alpha linoleic. I just know that the more um, pi bonds you have the more it will cross-link and therefore the better a drying oil is it is. So drying oils are uh, vegetable oils that dry to a hard finish at normal temperature. Once upon a time when there was wood available to make furniture, people would build a chair or a chest out of wood and then they would um, coat it with tongue oil. And tongue oil keeps the color of the grain, which some people consider attractive, draws out the grain color and then it dries to protect the wood. It's called a drying oil. It's supposed to say painting it. If you don't have good wood, if you have junky wood, that's when you paint it. You cover up the natural color of the, the grain. Um, in addition to the oils listed, uh, walnut oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil, some here I have never heard of before. Linseed oil is uh, a polymer used highly suitable for wood finishing. We've seen that. I've seen that personally. It's used in oil paints as plasticizer and as a hardener in putty and making linoleum. Poppy seed oil. It's used in linseed oil. Oh. 
similar in usage but with better color stability and some other ones here so you can put the um, the oils in the in your salad and you can eat them or you can put them in the linoleum on the floor or you can coat your wood with them as a coating amazing stuff tongue oil used as an industrial lubricant is highly effective drying agent um, and so on and so forth so there you are pretty I think important stuff for you to know about paint manufacture with um, esters alright a little bit more almost done with this um, unsaturated oil modified alkydes for alkyde paints no doubt you've heard of alkyde paints so on the previous page uh, drying oils like linseed oil and tongue oil are naturally occurring triglycerides triglycerides are triesters of fatty acids such as linoleic and linolenic acid the drying oils are modified by partial ester, ester exchange with glycerol called like glycerolysis the modified oils are polymerized by reaction with phthalic anhydride the polymer contains unsaturation double bonds from the drying oils and these cross-link in the presence of oxygen during air drying of the paint film so that's a summary of everything we've drawn on the last page short oils with few double bonds give hard durable finishes but require baking to cure have you heard of baked enamels if you buy an appliance It'll often say when you're buying it's got a baked enamel paint, which means it's a hard, durable finish. So that's where that comes from. Uh, long oils with many double bonds, they dry faster, but then they're softer and less durable and may yellow on aging. So here's some examples of uh, Glipdal resin we talked about earlier, as well as um, alkyd paints. Almost there. FRP fiberglass reinforced plastic so another example of an unsaturated polyester FRP FRP stands for fiberglass reinforced plastic uh, most commonly made with a diol and either maleic anhydride or fumaric acid so here is fumaric acid this is trans butene dioic acid the cis form is often more stable as the anhydride form as you can see on the right they're essentially the same thing what's the functionality of this well it's got two carboxylic acids that makes it difunctional if we can then cross link through the the carbon to carbon double bond that makes it tetrafunctional really doesn't it so this can be used to make cross links and that's what's done here fiberglass reinforced plastic is a thermoset so polymerization is carried out here's our dicarboxylic acid either fumaric or the anhydride with a diol here I've tried to approximate this in some fashion until a linear unsaturated polymer liquid is obtained again it's just sterification reactions over and over again with different molecules this is then dissolved in styrene here's styrene here it's vinyl benzene producing a viscous stinky stinky solution something you don't want to breathe too much of and uh, cobalt naphthenate is added to accelerate it right so you buy this stuff in a can this this linear thermoplastic polymer it's a heavy viscous liquid dissolved in styrene and then in a separate small container you get a little bit of this peroxide the most common one is methyl ethyl ketone peroxide and mix them together mix the liquid together within 15 to 30 minutes it hardens up like like a rock cross-linking now it's often combined with glass fibers I'll show you different types of glass this is glass woven fibers glass matted fibers and here are some examples of that tubes here's glass matting you can purchase it in rolls and then you would lay it out on whatever you're trying to repair say you're doing some boat building or repairing a uh, part of your car that's damaged um, and you paint on the polyester resin here's the resin and there's the 
the peroxide that comes with it, MEK peroxide. Maybe you've seen some of these in the stores. You can come as clear liquids. They can come with uh, f fillers in them already, but it basically works the same way. All right, so we're going to conclude by looking at some of the properties and applications then of polyesters, and there's quite a few. Let's first take a gander at some of the applications here. Again, we mentioned polyethylene terephthalate, pop bottles, and all kinds of plastic containers. Perhaps you recognize some of these components from your automobile, some of these items from around the house. Uh, now down here we have polycarbonate for eyeglasses, polycarbonate labware. You want unbreakable labware? Polycarbonate's what you want. Uh, unbreakable lenses for your car? Good idea. Polycarbonate. We'll come back on the next page, but let's read a little bit here. So polycarbonate's not surprisingly denser than water, like all the non-hydrocarbon polymers. They're right, quite strong and, in fact, quite stiff. FRP means fiberglass reinforced plastic, and so they're going to be stronger and stiffer. And these will be thermosets, so they wouldn't have a melting point listed here. The water absorption is moderate to low. Uh, the price is a little higher than polyolefins like polyethylene, polypropylene, PVC, and the crystallinity is, well, medium ish. All right, so first of all, polyethylene terephthalate. It's an engineering resin. Think of pop bottles. Low crystallinity, that means amorphous, that means good optical clarity. It has high melting point. Why? Because it's an ester, so it's got a lot of polarity to it. It's got high impact resistance and strength, moderate polarity, low moisture absorption, low CO2 permeability. Kind of interesting because that's what they pump CO2 into, right? Those are pop bottles. Good electrical properties or insulators. High melting point, high strength arise from the aromatic groups in the case of the aromatic PET. Polyesters are not self-extinguishing, but they can be made so by the addition of various chlorine reagents or antimony trioxide themselves. Not very safe, but can be done. PET is FDA approved for food service. Uh, polyethylene terephthalate fibers include Dacron, Terraline and Fortrell, and films are called mylar. Uh, many, many applications. The resins are used to make housings for pumps, maybe your sump pump, light duty gears, auto ignition coils, as I showed you, lamp sockets because of their electrical resistance, electrical switches, connectors, electrical hand tools, again, impact resistant and electrically insulating, sterilizing food packaging. Certainly a, an important polymer in our everyday life. Polycarbonate, right? That's bulletproof glass. Outstanding optical clarity. It's actually better than glass itself in any thick pieces. If you have to use a thick, thick window, then polycarbonate is actually, it is, in fact, clearer than glass. It has its limitations. Um, low impact resist, uh, sorry, it's extremely impact resistance, but poor scratch resistance, and that's perhaps one of its Achilles heels. Easy to scratch. It is UV sensitive as well high temperature resistance, moderate polarity, low water absorption. Uh, now, you can buy a lot of labware. You can buy graduated cylinders and beakers and um, pipettes. You just want to name it. You can buy it in polycarbonate. And we used to, I used to buy that for the engineers who worked in the labs that I operated because they could break anything, but they couldn't break polycarbonate. And you can bounce it. I bounce it off the floor and see if you can bounce it and catch it in the air as it comes back up. You can do it. It doesn't hurt it at all. But but nothing's perfect. Poor chemical resistance. They'll resist alcohols, acids and bases, but they're attacked by oxidizers, acids, and many solvents. So if you put acetone in there, dichloromethane, ether, they're done, right? They're done. So be careful about that. Don't ever clean your eyeglasses with anything other than alcohol or soap and water. Put any other solvent on them and you'll have a permanent smudge on it. They're done. Yeah, they're, okay, they're brake resistant lenses for eyeglasses. They are good for auto tail lamp lenses. They are bulletproof windows, microwavable containers, uh, recyclable bottles, electronic parts, applications. How, there are lots of applications for polycarbonate. 
the primary use for unsaturated cross-linked polyesters would of course be for FRP, fiberglass reinforced plastic, uh, auto bodies like the Corvette, uh, boat and auto body repair kits, business housing, and in fact molded shower inserts. I think I have a picture here somewhere right there. There's a molded shower insert made of FRP, fiberglass reinforced plastic, and of course here's a picture of your Corvette that you own. Um, it's made of fiberglass reinforced plastic. And then finally we have oil modified paints, alkyd paints. Right. I think I have a few more pictures on the next page. Polyethylene terephthalate sheet film. Here is Dacron, uh, used to make rope. Here's our polycarbonate labware, and I don't know who the fool is behind that bulletproof glass, but apparently it's bulletproof. And here's our fiberglass reinforced plastic using polyester resin. And there's your Corvette Stingray again. One thing I did not mention, and I probably should have. Yeah, I just don't, I want to just mention this so you're aware of it. You should hear of it. Polycarbonates were all the rage for water bottles a few years ago because they are transparent, they are unbreakable. Uh, but it was found that some of the monomer in the polymer, some of the bisphenol A, BPA for short, can migrate out and is hazardous. Um, now the truth is I would think in almost any polymer there's probably some monomer trapped in the matrix and I suspect that virtually any polymer has some traces of monomer and if those monomers are dangerous well there is a potential risk. Um, maybe with polyethylene it's very small because the monomer ethylene is so volatile maybe it'll escape but in the case of polycarbonate not so much this monomer hangs around bisphenol A. Bisphenol A was identified a few years ago. If I can find it here, where are you? Yes. As causing breast cancer and prostate cancer. And since it was used to make water bottles and baby formula bottles, it quickly fell out of um, fashion to use. So you'll see sometimes um, now in literature it says non-BPA, meaning that it does not have any bisphenol A, so it's not polycarbonate, so beware of polycarbonate in food applications. I don't know how serious it is as a problem, but I know it's been identified, so it's something to be aware of. It's a wonderful, um, polycarbonate is certainly a wonderful uh, industrial chemical for many applications, but it may not be in fact appropriate for food applications where there's a risk of some of the monomer leaching into the food source. Now that's it for polyesters.